Today I would like to talk about a very short parable that uh, provides a very great amount of information about spiritual life, almost like a vitamin pill. You know, you see those vitamins that you buy, one a day vitamins or whatever, has a long list of ingredients, all in one, all in one pill. Parables are like that. They have a long list of lessons and ideas contained in a very compact sentence or two and the parable that I want to talk about this morning uh, is uh, such a parable. It's one about the, uh, about the kingdom and it teaches us a lot about spiritual life. Matthew 13, actually there were two parables there and the one I want to talk about is the one about the leaven where Jesus spoke another parable to them. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three pecks of meal until it was all leavened. Now, Luke also recounts this parable in much the same way, not adding much information. This parable in both Matthew and Luke is included in a group of parables where Jesus is talking about the kingdom, giving information about the kingdom. Now, the word parable meant to lay alongside or to, to compare. And the idea was to tell a story or have a teaching about something that is seen, something that is experienced, in order to explain something that is not seen, something that is spiritual in nature. You, know, you lay aside a story here about things and people and events that you actually can see, you can understand, you can relate to, and that story has significance in the spiritual world about things that you cannot see, a kind of a parallel if you wish. So the way things worked in the story about material objects reflected, or as I said, paralleled the way that unseen or, unspirit or spiritual things worked in the heavenly realm. After all, Jesus had to explain to physical people in physical surroundings, He had to explain to them things that took place in spiritual surroundings, and He used parables to do this. So this is why Jesus begins with the words, the kingdom of heaven is like, because he is trying to explain in physical terms a spiritual reality, a spiritual entity. Basically he says that this spiritual thing called the kingdom of heaven is like or functions like or or is like this physical thing called leaven, or what we would call today yeast. Now understand that he didn't say that the kingdom of heaven was only like leaven, only like yeast. Jesus gave many parables in an effort to describe this heavenly kingdom. And each of the parables explained or highlighted a particular feature or a particular aspect of the kingdom of heaven. Now we don't have time to study every single teaching, every single parable about the kingdom of heaven in order to put the pieces of the puzzle together so that we can get you know, a complete picture of what Jesus was trying to uh, explain about the kingdom. So let me summarize what the Lord meant when He talked about the kingdom of heaven and then we'll make an application about this particular parable in the book of Matthew. So let's talk about the kingdom of heaven, summarize some ideas contained in the New Testament about the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus spoke of the kingdom, he was not referring to a geographical dominion. In other words, he wasn't talking about the United Kingdom, you know, like Britain or the ancient Babylonian kingdom. He wasn't talking about an earthly kingdom. The word kingdom in the Bible, in the Greek language in which the New Testament was written, the word kingdom, when used by Jesus, meant sovereignty or rulership or the royal power of God. So the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or simply the kingdom in the Bible referred to God's rulership. Therefore the kingdom exists wherever God's authority or God's sovereignty is present and recognized. In heaven, in God's kingdom exists and it is recognized by spiritual beings that exist there, angelic beings and so on and so forth. We know that Lucifer was an angel who refused this authority, this kingdom if you wish, 
And the Bible says that he and those who followed him in rebellion were cast down from heaven. 2 Peter 2 verse 4, Jude 6. Now when Jesus prayed, he prayed that God's kingdom come. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the familiar Lord's Prayer, right? In Matthew 6 verse 10. That the kingdom come and that the Lord's will be done. This is a, a parallelism, it's a, it's a device of literature. Jesus is simply repeating the same idea in two different ways. That the kingdom come and that the Lord's will be done, that's exactly the same thing. God's kingdom and God's will are one and the same. Jesus came to bring the kingdom or the rulership of God here on earth because men had rebelled against God through sin. That's what the Bible is about, from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. Man's rebellion against God through sin and how God deals with that rebellion. And so in Luke 17, 21, Jesus said to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. He could have said the sovereignty of God is in the midst of you. He could have said the rulership of God is in the midst of you, the will of God is in the midst of you. We translate the word kingdom. Jesus was God made man. He came to bring God's rulership and God's sovereignty back to a rebellious world by saving it from sin. And so where the king was, there was the kingdom. So when people received the king, they entered into his kingdom his rulership, his sovereignty. I'm just trying to get across the idea that in the Bible, the authors use many times, the Holy Spirit obviously, use different words to express the very same idea. And this is the, this is the pattern here for the teaching on the kingdom. Now, the king of the kingdom is Jesus Christ. And the way into the kingdom is through the new birth. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and the Spirit, he cannot enter into what? The kingdom of God, the sovereignty of God, the will of, same, same thing, same thing, John 3.15. After the death and the burial and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, Peter preached to the crowds on Pentecost Sunday and he invited them to do what? To come into the kingdom of God. When he said, repent, let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. This new birth in water and in spirit, Jesus talked about was the new birth in the waters of baptism that resulted in the Holy Spirit coming to dwell within the, uh, within the believer. The new birth, the way into the kingdom. So the Bible refers to this kingdom in a lot of ways. It says the kingdom, just the kingdom, Matthew 4, 23. Or the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5, 3. The kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. The kingdom of the Father, Matthew 13. Kingdom of Christ, Ephesians 5. Kingdom of His dear Son, Colossians 1. Kingdom of the Lord, 2 Peter. Different words, same idea. All of these references point to only one kingdom. The kingdom that all of us enter into when we believe in Jesus, the King, and obey His gospel in repentance and baptism. Marty said as much this morning when he introduced our new brothers in Christ, he said, he didn't know what I was preaching even, he said, welcome into the kingdom. Well, of course, they experienced the new birth and they entered into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Lord, the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, you know, they entered into the kingdom. The New Testament also has one other way to refer to the kingdom here on earth, and that is through the Greek word ecclesia, which means the called out. Now in ancient times, this word would refer to those men who were specifically chosen to lead in public government the local leaders of a village or town, you know, the town fathers, they were the ecclesia, they were the called out. And Jesus took this common word and he used it to describe those who were called out of the world and brought into the kingdom. With time this word ecclesia became exclusively associated with Jesus and his followers. 
all of those who heard the call of the gospel and entered into the kingdom were referred to as the ecclesia. Now we've translated this Greek word in a variety of ways into English. One word is the assembly. Another word is the church. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church, my ecclesia. So when we close the circle on our discussion of the kingdom and what it is, we see several things that Jesus says about the kingdom and what the kingdom is about. One, it's the presence of God and His sovereignty, Luke 17, 21. Two, it's the final fulfillment of everything that God has promised and the final status that will be established when Jesus returns, Revelation 11, 5. Three, it's the quality of spiritual life that one enjoys in one's relationship with God in Christ. Jesus said, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul rather says that in Romans 14, 23. It's our spiritual experience with God. Remember, keep in mind what I told you, the Bible is always using the same word to describe these things. The kingdom is my experience of God. The kingdom is my fellowship with others who have entered into the kingdom. Fourth, the kingdom is also that group of people who have experienced the new birth in water and spirit and who we refer to as the church. So when Jesus is speaking in parables about, quote, the kingdom, He's referring to one or a combination of these various facets of the kingdom of heaven. When he talks about parables, or rather when he gives a parable concerning the kingdom, he's talking about either the rulership of Christ the King, or he's talking about the final status of creation, or he's talking about the experience of spiritual life, or he's talking about the actual persons that are part of the kingdom. Now one rule in Bible study is when Jesus or the apostles are teaching something, they don't teach everything about a particular subject in one verse. Usually they're talking about one aspect of it and you have to go through all the verses to kind of put it together. Well, it's like that for the teaching of the kingdom. So with that in mind, hopefully you can hold those ideas in mind, let's go to the parable of the leaven in 1333 and, and kind of go a little deeper and see what is he trying to teach us about the kingdom with this parable. Short parable, a lot of significance for the kingdom. Well, the practical and the primary story is very simple. When you, when you uh, develop uh, or teach about a parable or study a parable, you have to first of all understand what's the practical, what's the physical side of it before you make an application to the spiritual side. So the physical side is very simple. Leaven or yeast is a substance added to dough which by fermentation produces carbon dioxide gas and thus makes the dough rise and become porous. The making of bread is an ancient practice and Jesus describes the normal procedure used at that time for the baking process. Now the key to the parable is that he compares the kingdom of God to the leaven and what the leaven does to the bread. Leaven affects the flour. Leaven permeates the flour completely, he says. And leaven is the, ancient of the agent of change in the mix. So those are the physical aspects of the parable. Now let's look at the spiritual application. Now that we have a clearer view of what the kingdom is, and we've reviewed the effect of leaven on flour in the making of bread, let's put these two together and draw some conclusions on what Jesus meant when He said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Well, first of all, let's look at how leaven and the kingdom are alike. Let's compare. First of all, both are added to the mix. Jesus and His kingdom are injected into the world from another dimension. Just like you add the leaven, you don't add the flour. Jesus came to this world, the world did not come to Him. That's one similarity. Another similarity between leaven and the kingdom, both are agents of change. Jesus and His church transformed the world. 
Without the leaven, the flour cannot be made to rise. Agents of change. Without Jesus and His kingdom, the world cannot be saved. The world cannot be changed. The world is doomed. Third similarity, both leaven and the kingdom work silently and unseen. The power of the kingdom is not physical and yet it produces definitive results. The texture and taste of bread is the result of the unnoticed but very necessary yeast that it contains. The ways of God and His kingdom are not the ways of man and this world, but they do have a great impact on this world. Human beings, even in Jesus' day, were skeptical, uh, skeptical of spiritual things, and Jesus was trying to show them that even in the physical world, silent and unseen forces were responsible for the very basic necessities of life, just like bread. If they could understand and accept the manner and results of simple transforming agents like leaven, then they could also accept and understand the much more powerful agent of change that God had sent into the world, which he referred to as the kingdom of God. Now, for those who listened but didn't believe, the most that people could understand was the fact that Jesus was comparing this thing called the kingdom to this everything, to this everyday and quite common thing called leaven. In verses 34 and 35, Matthew says that Jesus used parables to keep hidden from unbelievers the things, the message, the truths of the kingdom. So if you're a believer and you understand what the kingdom is, then you have other applications that you can make based on this parable that unbelievers cannot make, cannot see. So we go further. Remember I said there are a lot of things contained? Those are the basic things. Let's go a little further into this parable. Like leaven, the rulership of Christ comes from elsewhere, not part of this world. That He changes the world from lost to saved. You believe and identify and understand that His Holy Spirit is unseen by the human eye but powerfully at work in the lives of every believer. As believers, we understand that idea. We can see the similarity uh, and the lesson that is taught about the unseen work of the Holy Spirit in this very simple parable. Believers can see another application. Like leaven, the final effect of the kingdom will be complete, reaching every generation and place in the world. In the end, the destruction of the world, the judgment, the establishment of an eternal relationship with God will be the result of Christ's Lordship and His kingdom. And then one other thing you might see, like leaven, the experience of spiritual life is not always visible to the naked eye or to the ear. We know the Holy Spirit's power acting for and in us by the results we see in our lives, even if we can't understand exactly how those results are obtained. And a lot of times we, we want, we're trying to see those results by looking simply at today. But I encourage you to look back over the last 10 years, the last 20 years. That's how you get a vision for how the Spirit of God has worked in your life. Like leaven, the church is the component, the ingredient in this world that is the agent for spiritual influence. You know, before the church, there was worldwide slavery, Cruelty to children and women were common. Human life was not held as sacred. Immorality was rampant. Regardless of what modern liberals think, the Christian church has been the agent for the greatest changes for good in society in all of history. Nothing else has created change for good like the church has. And so with this little parable, Jesus pointed ahead to all of these many facets that the kingdom could and would be even to this day and even beyond, you realize the leaven of the kingdom continues to work today and will continue to work until Jesus returns, no matter how long that takes. And all of that is taught to us by this tiny little parable that is one or two verses long. Well, I hope that this passage and the idea of the kingdom will be more meaningful for you in the future. I also hope that most of us here see beyond the simple story of how a woman makes bread 
and rather we can perceive the application of the parable to our own selves today. If you're not sure, let me give you a few direct and personal applications of this parable today for you, and then the lesson will be yours. First application, this is for you, this is for me, about the parable of the leaven. You ready? First application, you're in or you're out. You're in or you're out. In all of the universe, in all of existence, there are only two places to be, in the kingdom or out of it. There is no neutral zone. There is no hiding place. You're in or you're out. If anyone here has not openly acknowledged their faith in Christ, repented of their sins and been baptized, in other words, immersed in water, they're not in the kingdom. You know, sitting in the church building is not the same as being in the kingdom. There's a difference, a very big difference. Another personal application, number two, your leaven or your flour. It's the leaven that makes the flour rise, not vice versa. So you have to ask yourself, are you an agent of change or are you the one being changed? As Christians, as those in the kingdom, are we responsible for changing others in the name of Christ or are they changing us to the shame of Christ? If the leaven is no good, if it doesn't affect the flour, what does the baker do? Well, he just throws it away. The encouragement is, let's be leavened, let's make sure that we are the influence for change in our surroundings and not the other way around. One more application. You're complete or you're incomplete. Jesus said that the leaven was inserted into the flour until it was completely leavened. Now there's a cute saying that people put into cards and posters. I've seen it often. It says, be patient please. God is not finished with me yet. You ever see that? You know, you've come a certain way in the kingdom, you've grown to a certain level, you've dealt with certain things. The question is, what's left? What has the leaven not leavened yet in your life? Yes, I get it, God isn't finished with you yet. Okay, that's cute, that's good. So what's left to do? Why isn't He finished with you yet? Is it His fault or is it your fault? What's holding up the building process? You know, some people use that thing as an excuse to just stay where they are. What obstacle is before you at this very moment that is stopping you from fulfilling more completely God's will, God's kingdom in your life? You know, we have an opportunity for the kingdom to grow here in Choctaw. Every day we have the opportunity to leaven our surroundings. Read a book about church growth where the author was saying that, never mind going to find people that we don't know, you know door knock on a stranger's door, that's all well and good. You know. But each person has seven or eight people that they know personally at work, in their family, whatever, who are not Christians. Start with them. Start sharing the gospel with the seven or eight contacts that everybody has. Start leavening your surroundings with the knowledge of Christ. Now, we have an opportunity to do something even here to grow the kingdom this morning. Perhaps some need to be added to the kingdom by baptism, as Josh and Dylan were this week. Perhaps some need to expand the kingdom by stepping forward in greater commitment, greater obedience to God's word. Others may need to identify their desire to serve with the part of the kingdom that meets here in Choctaw. The invitation is always open. The opportunity is always there to grow the kingdom of God. If you feel the need to be part of that growth this morning, then we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.